All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Hannah Kripo. I'm the Content Marketing Manager here at Certiport. We're so happy to have you joining us for our eighth Certified Academy Business Webinar. Please feel free to drop into the chat and let us know where you're joining from and what courses you teach so we can all get to know each other. Everyone should have the ability to chat amongst yourselves as well as with us, the hosts and the panelists, so that we can all get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, we always get this question, so I just want to make sure to address it up front. This session is being recorded, so we'll re send out a link to the recording after um, the session has wrapped this afternoon. All our attendees are currently on mute, so if you have questions, please make sure to drop those into either the Q&A or the chat feature, and we'll make sure to address those with our panelists today. Uh, the session is being sponsored by Certiport's My Pathway program. My Pathway is a resource designed to enhance a learner's online Certiport account by providing direction for stackable credentials that lead to careers, while providing labor market data and salary information in a single location. And that ties in very well with our um, discussion today about learning outcomes. And we have an incredible team joining us. So I'll make sure to give them their due, hopefully with a quick introduction. Our first panelist is Kathy Schmidt. Kathy is a 10-year veteran teacher with 25 years of firsthand experience applying Microsoft products in the business industry. Kathy entered the career and technical education field to prepare students for the rigors and realities of the work world. Having been passed over for workplace advancement because she lacked certification or college credentials, she understands the importance and value of certification. Kathy will be the first to tell in her enthusiastic manner that certification matters, but above all else, she will share with you and make you a believer that certification is for everyone. Second, we have Karen Columbi. Karen has taught a variety of career and technical education courses at the eighth and eighth through 12th grade level, as well as the community college since the early 2000s. Her focus is on expanding hands-on and experiential learning in meaningful ways to add valuable tools to the student's toolbox, building confidence and a resume of tangible skills to market in the workplace. Karen has seen certifications used to enhance resumes for those who need to get right to work, as well as to differentiate students working toward competitive internships, scholarships, and college programs. The most significant connection from certification to the real world is understanding how to work to achieve goals using the resources available. And I know that that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about this afternoon. Before teaching, Karen worked for over a decade as an avionics technician with Boeing, DynCorp Aerospace, and the US Air Force on programs including Air Force One, the B-2 bomber, and multiple F-16 deployments abroad. Our final panelist is Eric Yakovich. Eric is a director of economic development at the Port of Kalama, Washington, where he manages properties, marketing, strategic planning, marine terminals, parks, recreation, and security. Kalama is his hometown, and he holds a bachelor's and master's degree in business administration. He has 30 years of experience in nonprofit leadership as an accountant, finance director, and chief executive officer. Mr. Yakovich resides in Kalama with his wife, and they have two adult children and one grandchild. He enjoys time with his family, friends, and Husky football. We're very excited to have these amazing guests here with us today. So before we dive into our topic, I just wanted to give everyone a chance to introduce themselves in a less formal way. So we'll go ahead and start, Eric, with you, if you could just introduce yourself to our attendees today. Hi, Eric Yakovich, uh, Port of Kalama, as Hannah said. Um, I've worked here for nine years, but lived here most of my life. And uh, I've got several years of business leadership under my belt, mostly in the finance side of things, but I'm also at the executive leadership level and uh, just happy to help however I can share their experience. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Kathy, we'll come to you next. Woohoo! <laughs> so excited to be here with everybody. I love Microsoft certification. So anyone who knows me knows that's a fact. Um, I came from business, like Hannah said, I was a teacher for 10 years and I have watched certification change lives. Um, so I'm super excited to talk about that and talk about mapping things to your curriculum and helping you strengthen your students. Um, I didn't say this in my bio, but I am married to my high school sweetheart. I have three kids and nine grandkids who are the light of my life. <laughs> Awesome. That we could talk about that for a while. I was wondering as well about Eric's little grandbaby. So we'll have to touch on that a little bit later. But Karen, we'll come to you next. You want to give us a quick introduction? 
Hi everyone, I'm Karen Columbi, and I'm actually speaking to you from my classroom. So my students are looking at me right now because I was supposed to be in a conference room, but the Chromebook didn't work out. Just gonna say, we all know how that works when technology doesn't do what we expect and we have to act on the fly. So, hey, I'm here to talk about it today. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. We're so happy to have you. Hopefully we get to see your students make a pop in in the background as well. Now, we know we're talking about learning outcomes today, and I know that this is a very relevant topic, of course, for CTE, where we have students working to learn specific skills demanded by the workforce. And so we have education representation, as well as workforce represented in this panel today. And I wanted to start our conversation about what are the skills that our employers are looking for? So Eric, we'll start with you. And then Karen and Kathy, from your experience in working with your students, what are those skills that employers are looking for? So Eric, let's, let's have you start us off. Well, I certainly think that uh, first and foremost, when we look at applicants, we're going to be looking for some of the more formal mm. aspects of uh, the job, such as education and experience. Um, the intangibles are really important as well. Uh, how you get along with other people, how you, how you communicate, um, your presentation, your professionalism. Um, certainly, basics of an employment are just showing up on time. You wouldn't think this, right? I'm, I'm 54 now, and these things were instilled in me just as a child. Um, but these days, we seem to have lost a little bit of touch mm. with some of those real basics, like uh, being respectful, showing up on time, um, being presentable, on time for meetings, you know, studying making sure that you know the topic before you show up for a conversation. So, um, and then I think uh, pertinent to our conversation today, every business that I've been a part of has, for the last 25 years, has solely used Microsoft Office mm -hmm. products. Right? Email is Outlook. Mm -hmm. the, um, Word is, you know, the next, the next, uh, primary tool and then and then you kind of go down from there some people use powerpoint a few less people use excel just depends on your job right but but um certainly word and, and outlook are just really primary expectations of employment i love that you touched on um studying and i know that's something we talked about as well in our previous conversations is understanding employer expectations and kind of being able to to jive with the culture but also knowing what is expected of you when you walk in and i think karen and kathy can speak a lot to this about you kind of have to have those explicit conversations with your students about some of those hard and soft skills so karen let's let's speak to you next what's been your experience about skills that your students need as they go into the workforce well, one of the things is that we have four, four children of our own. So having, mm -hmm. ki having kids, I think of it like if you tell a, one of your own kids to go clean the kitchen, they may not clean it to your expectation, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you really need to make what your expectation is really clear. I was mm -hmm. going to share something with you, but I see I'm, I'm disabled. Can you? Well, you change? know what? I will. Let's change that. Yeah. So one of the things I do in my professionalism for the kids is we sort of go over what does that look like? So let's say if you were cleaning my kitchen, I might need the counters wiped off, right? The kind of stuff the food put away, that would yeah. be on a list. Why don't we do that with professionalism? We just mm -hmm. expect them to know how to be professionals? I don't think so. So let me show you this. Each week, kids get something. I don't know if y'all are seeing this. Yes. Okay, so you would get one of these and you get to fill it out yourself. I will, um, if you go all the way to the bottom, it says, if you're doing this five days a week, you give yourself a five in that area, four days, you know, you don't get to give 0.5s. So either you did it or you didn't in mm. each area. So we go kind of go through and talk about these. Proper use of etiquette. Are you asking questions? Um, and it's all sort of, you know, under these subheadings, like, did you come in? and have your cell phone put away and your AirPods out of your ears, keeping conversations where they should be, work without supervision. So just think about all those things. You know, even for the student who thinks that I'm expecting too much, just the fact they have to read through this each week, 
maybe in the back of their head, they now know what professionalism mm-hmm. is, where before they may not have like participate and speak in your team meetings, complete team tasks, come prepared. Um, just one of those things that if you don't have it, you'll know it pretty quickly. Like, mm-hmm. where am I, where am I, you know, off task on this? Yeah. So right down to the shop cleanup and how we resolve, you know, how, how are we resolving this right down to my digital loafing? <laughs> I, I like that because I think to your point, and I really appreciate the analogy because I think not everyone has the same level of expectations for cleanliness, as you mentioned, but also professionalism there. It looks different for everyone. So when we're going into a job situation, students need to know explicitly what's going to be expected of them. And Kathy, have you had a similar experience? What are some of the skills that employers for your students were looking for? Yeah, and I am fortunate to have merged into the perfect world mm-hmm. where I um, I came from teaching and I'm back in the work world, but I'm in the work world supporting teachers for Mm -hmm. Microsoft certification. So I work for CCI Learning and I get to do that. And it's really interesting that um, I get to go back and see all these things that I did in the classroom to help Mm -hmm. prepare students for work. And yet still in the work world, we're still looking for those same things. Same thing Eric said, same thing Karen said, and I can corroborate what Karen is saying. I mean, even in the work world, and Eric would probably agree with this, and you probably would too, Hannah, when yeah. when one department says something's ready and another department looks at it, it, it's like, we've all seen that cartoon meme, right? This is what the customer ordered. This is how sales interpreted it. Mm-hmm. This is how production looked at it. And then this is how it came out, which is totally different. So I love rubrics. I, I live and die by rubrics in the classroom for sure. And I, uh, I love that uh, in the education space, especially career and technical education, we have the opportunity to work with advisory boards, um, which Eric is a part of the Kalama mm-hmm. Advisory Board. And so they, we are able to say, what are you looking for in industry and how can we apply that in the classroom? And so I, I really like that. Um, and it's not that I like or dislike because we're going to do what the advisory board says right Mm -hmm. so but we know coming from industry that microsoft is a fundamental skill it's like using your being able to use a phone if you don't Mm -hmm. know how to use a phone you don't know how to communicate regardless of what kind of phone it is and it's just a communication tool and so it's uh that's what i love about advisory boards is you really get the picture of what needs to happen thank you for that and i think that ties in perfectly with what I wanted to talk about next is how can we make sure educators in the classroom are teaching the skills that employers are looking for? And so I think that advisory committee is a huge part of that. And Eric, I know that um, Kathy mentioned that you're on the advisory committee. Uh, so I wanted to talk about your experience with that. What has it been like sharing what skills educators need to be teaching in the classroom? I, I think we have a very effective CTE advisory committee. Mm. And, and I think the key to that is um, accepting, being really open to feedback and, and accepting and incorporating that feedback yeah. into the actual classes. I think I've been on, I've been on other committees, not CT, but on plenty of other committees where you're asked for feedback, you give it, but it doesn't ever get reflected right. in, the, in, in the product. And um, I would just encourage everyone to just be real honest and open about these processes and being open to hearing something that may not agree with your curriculum, because Mm -hmm. that's the point, right? Mm -hmm. To improve curriculum and improve the experience for students. I I think about uh, one of the things that Karen put up was uh, on her rubric was teamwork. And teamwork is kind of a pet peeve of mine when it comes to education. I, I, through my own education and see my my children, it's, it's more apropos these days that it'll be put into a group and say, here, mm-hmm. this is a team effort, produce this paper, this report. And I see them, one person does all the work. Mm-hmm. So there's no accountability to, you know, the, the, the students learning what teamwork means. Mm-hmm. It's just, they're told go be a team. And then one person does all the work and there's no accountability to mm-hmm. that. So I think if you're going to, uh, if you're going to teach people to be a part of a team, you also need to have some accountability 
consistently along the process for picking up your piece of the teamwork. Well, and I like that you talked about the whole idea is to have that continuous feedback loop of this is what business is looking for and for educators to be able to say, okay, this is how I need to adjust my curriculum. And I know in our previous conversations, when we were talking about how can educators look for changes on what's happening in industry, the biggest piece that you said was just ask us what we need and be willing to be flexible with that. And Kathy and uh, Karen, I wanted to get your thoughts on that as well. Where are you guys looking for information about what's happening in industry so you can make sure your curriculum is, is current? Karen, we'll come to you first. One of the best places that I have as a resource is our local work source or workforce mm. development. So they actually come in and help me with my whole resume and employment unit, and they do a mock interview for us. But Love before that. they before they ever even start, they sort of back up and say, hey, I teach freshmen. And they go, I know you're a year, maybe two years out from getting that job or internship. But this is the skills you need to be working on right Mm. now, because this is what we are looking for. And what I like is when they come in and they tell us, um, if you don't do your research on my company, you're probably not going to make it past, you know, this. If you aren't um, working as a team, if you're not showing up on time, you're not going to to get to the next level. So as many guest speakers as you can have in, the better. So one of my classes, we have people from industry in every single day. Um, It's Monday, Wednesday is one set of people and Tuesday, um, Tuesday, Thursday is another set of people. So I have six people in my classroom every day from from the industry. And when when kids don't do things, they're like, "Uh, it's not gonna happen. They come in virtually. And they come in in person, but they are very fast to tell kids this wouldn't fly at Microsoft or this wouldn't fly at Boeing. And this is why. And they would let them know what would happen on the job. So having direct feedback like this person is working, they're giving us an hour of their time and they're telling us right now in real Mm -hmm. time. Um, And that's thanks to Boeing and Microsoft, those big companies making it um, like clearing their schedule. So those people have an hour a day to spend with me. So it's great. I love that. And being able to utilize some of those connections, because I think it's one thing. I mean, we we can sing the praises of educators all day long, but it's awesome to be able to have your experience validated by someone who's working in industry as well. So I think there's a lot of value from that. And they are co-teachers. So they Mm. over the over the summer, they work to learn what we do and then yeah. they co-teach for those hours. So they're not just standing around watching the kids. <laughs> they're literally working with the kids all year. Amazing. Amazing. I love that idea. Kathy, did you have any other resources that you wanted to mention as far as making sure that the skills that you're teaching are current in the classroom? Yeah. Yes. Industry is always first and um, corroboration is king. <laughs> so anytime you can um, see a student, you can help a student see uh, something from multiple angles, yes. the more it sits in with them. Mm. Uh, but I also love to use indeed.com or LinkedIn. So I am um, in my curriculum. I, I teach a lot. I would taught a lot of certification. And so that was one of the things, the very first things that I ever did as an educator was help students buy into why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And so if we would go and make a chart, you know, with multiple different types of skills, um, hard skills, you know, whether that's Microsoft, Google, Mm -hmm. Cisco, VMware, whatever, or if you get right down to office skills versus, you know, fundamental skills or Mm -hmm. Azure or dynamics, customer relationship management, any of those types of things help them understand the amount of jobs that are available and the skills that are needed in those jobs. Mm. And as they start to see those skills in the jobs there, then they start to understand why it is we're doing what we're doing in class. So like when Karen pulls out that rubric or I pull out my professionalism rubric, they're not just like, oh, you know, so-and-so is so hard on us and yeah. has unrealistic expectations. But no, they see that. And like Eric pointed out, Companies are even putting into their job descriptions that um, employees are integrity is sought after and punctuality and Mm -hmm. those types of things that used to be considered baseline, a a, a normal thing um, now have to be spoken out loud. And so 
that's um, other than the advisory board and in industry first and foremost, but then I, I corroborate that information on indeed.com or through LinkedIn job searches and help students go to those types of job searches so that they are bought into mm -hmm. what it is they're doing. It's a part of their story as well. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing that I really like to point out to students is that because I was like Karen, I had seventh, eighth and freshman is that you are most likely going to find a job when you graduate high school that didn't exist today. Mm -hmm. And so I really need you to understand about transferable skills. Um, what you might learn in this class today in a Microsoft certification, you may take to your job in a different type of proprietary software, yeah. but it's the same skills. It's word processing versus using a spreadsheet versus organization using software yeah. versus using some type of customer relationship management software. Um, verbal and written communication skills mm. are across the board, no matter where you go, punctuality, teamwork, those things are all a global transferable skill. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answered your question. No, I, I think that's great. And I love that you've each cited, I think, a different source of that information. Industry, of course, is so important, but there's different ways to get access to that information. Not every school, not every district is going to have that advisory committee, although we would, of course, recommend that if that's not in place that you look into how you can start one. But I think there's other ways to get that information. And Kathy, I wanted to come back to you in thinking about these industry standards, these these skills that educators are looking to teach their students, how do you make sure that your curriculum is mapped to those skills that your students need before they walk into the job? Well, um, every state is a little different, I think, but mm -hmm. every teacher has uh, what they would call a course plan mm -hmm. or a, you know, a course syllabus. And so um, that's basically where it starts is, on a piece of paper, right? Mm -hmm. Or flesh it out on a word processing document. This is what industry says I need. What does my syllabus include? How are the units I'm teaching, you know, break that whole course down into units, which are broken down into lessons. And how in the very minutia of a day-to-day, -day, how do I break that down into step-by-step -step processes? You know, so you, you can say, yeah, I wanna certify my kids, my students. Mm -hmm. Well what kind of certification is it going to be where are you yeah. going to get the exams how are you going to teach not necessarily to the exam but to the exam so that they are able to pass the exam um, and how do you break those teaching steps down so in washington a lot of that is done through what's called a framework um, and so you actually have to submit that to the state and say um, in career and technical education if you want to get enhanced funding these are the things i'm teaching then they have requirements and you've either met all the requirements or they work with you, which includes working with some type of um, classroom to workplace setting, um, mm -hmm. maybe not necessarily uh, having a job, but some type of job shadow or mm -hmm. some kind of out of the classroom experience in the workforce. Um, and also includes association with some type of professional division, yeah. FBLA, DECA, um, Skills USA, whatever, so that students are understanding how to really apply all those skills right. with 21st century professionalism skills. And um, so that is, that's kind of a big picture, but yeah. um, I, I really like, and Karen's probably going to say the same thing. Mm. I really like to implement as many processes in the classroom as I remember being in the job. So if it was something I did at work, especially like when you teach a business class, it's mm -hmm. really beneficial, you know, to get them into a project that imitates something that actually goes on in the workplace. I love that. And I'm, yes, Karen, I did want to come to you next about... How are you making sure that you're mapping your curriculum to these industry standards? How often are you looking at your curriculum to make adjustments based on feedback from industry? So, so we look at our curriculum every year because every year your audience changes, right? Um, we like to think that um, sometimes the audience changes because the previous years, maybe they've had more technology in the classroom. But in our previous years, our big black swan event, of course, is um, COVID. So the kids come to us with maybe a little different skills. So working on the soft skills might be something 
that we're going to delve a little deeper into. And maybe the com complex pro um, projects, maybe they're not ready for that for a year or two till they till we can recoup from that COVID event. And we're seeing that in things like um, time on task, like if they can spend the time on task that they used to. So we'll adjust and it's fine. But big picture, I wanted to talk a little bit about like what Kathy was talking about, how do you develop a plan? Every year you think, what do I want the kids to leave with from this class? I always start with college credit. So I map to what, whoever I am doing my articulation agreements with and try to think, what, does, what is it that I want the kids to leave with? I want them to leave with Word, Excel, and PowerPoint minimum. Um, but some of my kids will leave with much more. So looking at that, you sort of build in those certificate time for certification, meaning they have to learn this actual program. They need to use the program and projects um, and understand how it's used and understand the vocabulary and, um, and then have time to test and um, practice for the test. So that all gets figured in along with things like college research and scholarship research and um, interview prep. So you ha it's, it's like a meal. You're preparing Thanksgiving and you can't serve everything. So you have to like lay out your menu and figure out what's important to this group of people coming to your meal. I like that. I, I'm loving all these food and home analogies because <laughs> I'm really connecting with those. But I think that, that that's a really valuable analogy that it's not necessarily depending on the group that you're working with you're not going to be able to offer everything that they need necessarily to be ready to just walk into the job and succeed but being able to establish a foundation of we need at least these and so for some I like that you touched Karen on this group that we're working with are students that have been through multiple years of virtual learning so the soft skills is going to be a really important piece. And I know that that's a huge part of what makes these students tomorrow ready is being able to adjust on the fly. A lot of these soft skills are super important. And so Eric, I wanted to come to you next, if we could, about thinking about these future uh, students, these future professionals that you're going to be working with. What are the skills that they need to be learning now to be ready for the workforce of tomorrow? I think we talked about it a lot earlier um, with the soft skills. I know um, communication is changing in the world, right? I mean, look at what we're doing right now. I would have never thought we'd be in this place. Um, and I think kids are are not as skilled at face-to-face -face communication anymore or team in interactions or whatever. Um, there are some kids that still get the team, you know, the, the sports teams and the stuff like that, but, um, but more and more kids are very phone oriented email. I don't even know about email text oriented basically. Right. So, so written and written and verbal face-to-face -face communication skills are really, uh, hard to come by. It seems like, mm -hmm. so anyways, that's, that's one thing that I would say is uh, really important. Uh, another another key, I think, is problem solving. You know, every kid that asked why, why do I have to do this math class? I'm never going to use math, right? So math is basic problem solving. You know, at at, at various levels, mm -hmm. and um, and so for kids to develop those problem solving skills um, to take into the workforce is really important because nobody's going to give you the roadmap every mm -hmm. day. They're going to say accomplish this. Here's your product. Now go get it done. Exactly. And uh, uh, it's it's extremely important. And some of these programs, I mean, again, in 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 varying ways, um, teach you those problem solving skills too. You can learn you can learn the basic for Excel and how to do you know A mm -hmm. plus B, but to really make it work for you, you have to employ some problem solving skills mm -hmm. and dig into all the options that it has to offer. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. yeah, you're never going to be able to master all of it at once, going back to Karen's comment from before. But I also read earlier this week the a quote that was talking about, you know, how do I respond when when students ask, I'm how am I ever going to use this? And I'm sure all of the teachers who are listening have heard that question multiple times. And she said, you know, I always tell my students, whether you use this exact principle or not, 
It's the foundation that it's setting up for you that's important. She said, I'd give this analogy about football. There's not going to be a time where you're going to see players just sitting on the field doing a bunch of squats. But that doesn't mean that strengthening those muscles and practicing that isn't important because it gives them the ability to move on to some of these higher level um, more complex skills that they need to be able to accomplish the game. And so Kathy, I wanted to come to you next in thinking about getting students to be tomorrow ready. What are the skills that you think we should be focusing on? Um, transferable. The word transferable to me was one of the most important words in my classroom. Mm -hmm. um, everything that we taught in that I taught in my classroom was transferable in one way or another. So mm -hmm. there was never just um, a single application for it. And, and that was a part of the discussion always mm -hmm. in my class because uh, every single teacher on this call or who listens or who has ever set foot in a, in a classroom will know you can teach the same class to three different sections of kids and they're all different. Mm -hmm. You're, you are never just like, whoo, <laughs> on the breeze I got three of the same class no problem I mean it is a, a hair easier but in the same sense it's individualized every mm -hmm. time and so the conversation is always all right we're going to learn this today and this is how you can apply it and then mm -hmm. after they've learned the skill then there's always a reflection mm -hmm. how did that go what did you learn that you didn't think you were going mm -hmm. to learn and how now do you think you can apply that? Because especially when you teach something like Excel or any technology, it's about what you think can happen that leads you to figure out how to do it. And so that was always one of my favorite reflection games was who can come up with the most unique way to apply this skill that we just learned. Mm. And so that really brought up some crazy conversations <laughs> sometimes, but uh, also opened the door and opened their mind and expanded their thought process to what can we do with this? Mm. That for me, that's a key for tomorrow ready, because you just don't know what you're going to get tomorrow, other than the fact that, you know, we're probably in four years, not going to be driving flying cars, but <laughs> you know, the technology is going to change and, and right. it is changing. AI is changing things at an exponential rate. And so not only do we have to learn how to use that skill, but we have to learn even if we can do it, should we be doing it yeah. or how do we do it appropriately? And I think in our previous conversation, you cited the importance of helping your students be investigators, not just yeah. learning kind of the basics, but figuring out creative ways to use the technology that they're learning. And so I think figuring out yep. not just how to use this in this situation, Lifelong learners. Out of the box. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I love that. And that's that. what I loved about those conversations is because mm -hmm. some, they, they only know what they know. Yeah. And so then I would throw out some business scenario and they're like, oh, I never, I never thought, thought of that, that before. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, someone would actually want that. Yes, they would. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> so Karen, tell me, tell me your thoughts as well. Oh, we have some guests here with us. This is exciting. And we're just going to pop in and show a few. So we've got Mr. Excel 2016 out. These are guys going to the national championship. Come here. Woohoo! Here's PowerPoint 2019 on your way. Come here. Um, Excel 2019. Come here. Love this. Oh, we only saw your shirt. It's okay. <laughs> show your little face. There you go. Get down there. All right. That's justice. All right. Here comes Ethan. He's Word. Um, 2019. Okay, on your way. Um, here's Alexis. She's, I think she's number one in PowerPoint right now for the spring. And Mr. Word. And then we have another one out for Excel. So they're just amazing running around doing their thing. So um, that's just one of those things that back to me because we're about to, I'm going to have to sign off because another class is coming in and I don't have a sub. But having this competition has allowed these kids to. Um, be individual contributors, but still be part of a team yeah. and, um, and try to be the best at something. So that is really very good because I think at this age, um, some of that, um, some of that competitive spirit might've died down a little bit during mm. those two and a half years at home. Yeah. So 
But did you have another question? I'm sorry. Yes, I did. I wanted to say, just in thinking about, especially those students that you just showed, thank you so much for bringing them in. How how do we help them to be tomorrow ready? I like that you talked about the competition, getting them to be kind of team players and thinking outside the box. What are some other skills that you are kind of driving home with your students for? So a, a, for lot that? Of it's just, a lot of it's just your classroom norms and how you run your class. Mm -hmm. um, are you solving the problems for them? Are they solving their own problems? Mm. Are they tethered to you or do they know what to do next if you're unavailable? All back to if they're working for Eric and Eric's in a meeting and I finish, do I know what the next step is? Or am I going to pull out my phone and play a game? Probably not a great choice, right? Mm. So one of my students said the best thing. He goes, um, a class with Mrs. Columbia is like a class in common sense. I went, I love it. And it's kind of true because they've done enough layered work where they can already guess what the next steps are. And mm -hmm. that's back to certifications. They make sense. They're logical. They know what's coming. We have charts in the back so they know which ones they're working on. Um, they already know what's coming next and how to use the resources. If they're wasting their time, it's on them. Mm -hmm. So, And since we're like an uh, office, I like to think if I owned an office, how many of you would be laid off? <laughs> and how many would still have a job, right? So I said, oh, I have to lay 10 people off. Who's it going to be in here, you think? And some of the people might have already turned their computer off for the day. And they're like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so just the little classroom norms, I think, really help to um, to get them ready. Just yeah, and making it ready. And making it simulate that real world environment. Because when and the back, boss walks around, you know. And, you and back to that. Eric with your team, we do a lot of, team stuff but you have to actually say what was my contribution each day like a timesheet so you can't just say i worked on excel you have to tell me i did this range of whatever and i contributed these and i created 14 more images you can't um you can't just get away with i worked on the project yeah. so that is so that is so important because i I, I just think it's a matter of attention to it i don't think it's a i don't think it's rocket science i just think it's a matter of inspecting what you expect mm. inspect what you expect so don't just lay it out there as an expectation expect that there's going to be a result from it well and we always go through when we start a team that there's always going to be that one person that's going to have to get an a so they micromanage the rest of the team i said i don't want that's not going to happen because in the real world no one's going to give you a project that you can actually manage by yourself you mm -hmm. need all four people on your team to do their job or you mm -hmm. will not be able to complete the project. Yeah. Um, so you have to give them the um, give them the freedom to actually do their work without you coming in and imposing your will on them. Yeah. So one of my favorite teams of all time. So Michael Jordan scored 50, 60 points a game and never won a championship. It wasn't until he made everyone else better around him mm. and he scored less that the championships came and that I think that's a really good team analogy um, I love it the people that can make others around them better as a group are going to be far more successful achieve more absolutely I love it, that it's been lovely but my next crew is in so I'm Karen thank you so much for being so great to really with appreciate you. you we appreciate Bye -bye. you and we'll we'll hang back for just one more question here with Eric and with Kathy um, Eric will come to you first um, just to close out our session today, we want to give some advice. So coming from industry, we wanted to get your thoughts on how, how educators looking to prepare these students for tomorrow's jobs, what can they do maybe just in thinking about something tangible? What's the next step to making sure that they're preparing these students for the workforce to come to your company and, and be able to walk in to, and get a job? I would suggest they just ask employers. Um, we we're happy to give feedback and we're mm -hmm. happy to help. I mean, um, it's a matter of just asking and then trusting that advice that you mm -hmm. do, trusting that feedback, right? Incorporating it. Don't just ask to ask, ask and incorporate and, um, and we'll be happy to help. You'll hear really honest feedback from the employers in your community, whoever they are, wherever I've been, uh, I've found that to be true. You can find those helpful employers. And uh, if you engage those folks, not for hours and hours a week, but for a brief conversation, you'll get the feedback you need. I really like that. And I actually heard a statistic and I can't remember the percentage off the top of my head, but um, 
there's an educator that I was able to connect with and he was talking about, you know, so many of the students that we work with are going to be employed in the area where they went to high school. Most people kind of stick around where they grew up, where their family lives. And so it's important that they know what employers in their area are looking for. So I love the idea of this feedback loop. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, to, to piggyback on that, I just want to say, I, I, I told you that I went to school here in Kalama, mm. but I didn't work here in Kalama for 25 years. Mm -hmm. When I went to school here, I had no idea of the jobs at the port of Kalama, which I could see from my classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so I went elsewhere for a job. I didn't think that job was here that I was looking for. Fast forward to 25, fast forward that 25 years, and all of those jobs are here. And we have 1,400 jobs down here, including in the office, in the field, engineers, accountants, um, work in the green chain at the lumber mill. I mean, there, yeah. there's, so, there's such a wide variety and it's a, just a matter of recognition. Uh, I was surprised to learn that our teachers uh, up at the school didn't really understand that either, you know, what was down here. So it's just a matter of making those connections yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and working with each other and, and caring enough to understand what's around you. Yeah, that's why I think conversations like this are so important because we do need to take time out of our day to be able to open up these conversations between education and industry. So thank you for, for taking the time to share that with us. Kathy, before we close, I'd love to get your thoughts as well. What can educators do to make sure their students are tomorrow ready? Um, I wanted to just piggyback on something that Eric said. Um, this hap We kind of brought this to life uh, before I left Kalama High School and that was a career fair. Mm. And so, we actually took the teachers on a tour of the business area in Kalama so that they could really start to understand some applicable ways to help students make association with that math class they don't think they're ever going to use versus or you know anything in English or even social studies or any of that even if it's just foundational courses that lead them and allow them into a degree program that then allows them into a job that they want to be in. And in, in our area, the timber industry is, is big. And so uh, one of those adjustments was they started a, a timber program um, because we have a, a lumber mill and mm -hmm. we have a lot of opportunity to work in the woods. And so uh, I think that that is really foundational in any program uh, helping it be tomorrow ready. And, and again, just reiterating, reiterating the fact that you have to emulate in the classroom what goes on in the real world. You can't make excuses for tardiness or mm -hmm. late work or work not turned in. I know that there are a lot of discrepancies in thought after, during and after COVID with those realities, but the I taught pre-COVID in the classroom mm -hmm. and the comfort that I always had as a teacher was that it was super easy for me to say, I can't cut you slack on that because that's not what my industry looks like. In my career and technical education course does not allow for that because we work does not accept late work. Mm -hmm. uh, the workforce does not accept the fact that you don't get your work done. You lose your job. Um, they don't they don't tolerate the fact that you just don't show up, mm -hmm. you lose your job. And so those were um, the tomorrow, uh, those are the everyday things. And then again, the for being tomorrow ready, I, I just love helping them expand their thought processes on how can this be used in multiple facets. Mm -hmm. You need to love, learn how to really enjoy the problem solving process. Mm -hmm. I think this can happen, but I don't exactly know how it can happen. So instead of asking me, the teacher, how it happens, I want to facilitate their learning process and say, you know, hey, I go check it out. Here's some good resources to check it out. Come back and tell me what you think. We'll chat about it. We'll build a team. We'll whatever, but they've got to learn how to do that problem solving, like Eric said, in order to be tomorrow ready, because like I said, 
the jobs are going to change so much in yeah, four years. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, both of you. And I would thank Karen as well for her thoughts. So we'll just have to do that <laughs> afterwards. But I just feel like this has been such a valuable conversation and thinking about what are these outcomes that we want our students to walk away with and how can we make adjustments in the classroom today to make sure that we're teaching to these skills. And I'm really excited because I think this is such a wonderful conversation to dovetail into our session for next week, which is about partnering with businesses. So if you're interested in starting one of these advisory committees or figuring out how you can bridge that gap between industry and education, we would encourage you to join that session. And I'll drop the link here into the chat so everyone can see that. Um, that will be next week, next Wednesday at the same time. And then we have, of course, if you're interested in testing any of these certifications out yourself, we've talked a lot about Microsoft Office today. We have a whole portfolio of business certifications that can help your students. Um, please respond to our emails as we send you the link to the follow-up recording. Uh, we can get you in touch with our cert report representative so you can test these out for yourself and see if these are something that you want to work with your students to be able to earn and be able to walk into the workforce ready with these skills that we've discussed today. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Eric, so much for taking the time out of your busy days to share your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you all with us next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hannah. Thanks. Have a great Have week, everyone. Thanks, everyone.